Well, good morning, church. If you would, please open your Bibles to me, the book of Romans this morning, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, as we excitingly start a week two of a four-week series called You Are Loved. My name is Matt Brooks. I'm the senior pastor here at First Baptist Church of Broken Arrow. I want to welcome you to our church as we're walking through right now a phrase that God has put all over our campus, that God has put on our minds, but I want to be bound on our hearts as we continue to follow Christ as we start this fall together. I want to remind you that our content team has put together a devotional that walks right along Side this sermon that you're about to hear. If you're interested in that this week as you continue to follow Christ, text the word Jesus to 45776. I want to talk today about the, the magnitude of God's love for you. And I'm going to give you this illustration to help, I pray, just set this within our hearts. Now, this is a $20 bill, okay? Who wants it? Yeah. Okay. Overwhelming majority of us. Good. All right. What about if I do this? Who wants it? Okay. Still take it. Still take it. All right, what if I do this? Huh? Still? Okay, but well, what if I tear it a little bit right here? Okay, right here at the top. Just, just a little bit. Okay, Storm, still want it? Okay, well, well what if I just fully divulge to you that, that Miss Brynn let this uh, available to me this morning. I, I get all my cash from her. She takes it anyway. And so as she was leaving this morning, uh, my dog Baker grabbed part of this. And so I had to grab it from his mouth. So this has been in a dog's mouth this morning. You still want it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why? Because $20 is $20. Because $20 is $20. You are right in that regardless of whether I crumple this up, whether I stomp on it, whether we tear it just a little bit, or, or even if it's been in my dog's mouth, Whatever circumstances come upon this dollar bill, it doesn't affect the worth and value of this dollar. It is still $20. So why is it then, if we with finite minds, if we in very moment to moment minds, if we in man, I need this $20 minds, if we can rightly choose, we want this dollar bill, then why is it sometimes when things happen in our life, we begin to question God's love for us? So when, when we feel weighed down by life, we begin to wonder, does God love me? Or when our circumstances begin to really stomp down, I didn't expect this on my calendar, Lord, who would have ever chosen this, Lord? We begin to question God's control, or even when it seems like relationships or circumstances are tearing us apart, or whether it just seems like we can do nothing right, not even our dog wants anything to do with this. Why does it begin to question God's love? When we come to Romans 8, may we remind ourselves in a Romans 3 world, the liberating truths of a God who loves you and will always love you from Romans 8. May we understand that God is not against us in Christ, but rather is for us in Christ. And so today, I want to show you from Romans 8, verses 31 through 39, no matter what has happened, no matter what you do, no matter what you don't do, that God is for you in Christ. And I'm going to give you one of the most incomparably rich truths on the love of God in Christ found in the entire Bible from Romans chapter 8. It was D.L. Moody, one of the greatest missiologists, evangelists the world has ever seen, that said, I would rather live in Romans 8 than in the Garden of Eden. You see, the Bible from Genesis to Revelation loves to marvel at God's love for you. For love is a defining characteristic of God who alone is perfectly loving and is the source of all love. You see, God defines love because God is the source of everlasting love. We can't live apart from God's love or fall beyond God's love as it is the best thing in life to know for certain that you are loved by God. God does not tolerate us, but God loves us with a full and forever love. And so late in his life, Paul writes to believers from Corinth who are under merciless persecution, endless hostility in Rome. And in Romans 6 through 8, he begins to establish the transforming hope and endless love that God has for all believers in Christ. He stresses two primary things in Romans 6 through 8. One, a believer's security in Christ and their certainty with Christ. And in Romans 7, Paul begins to give a monologue that each and, each and every one of us have. He says literally, the things that I know I should be doing, I don't. And the things that I don't want to do or never should do, I do. 
Who shall save me from this wretched person that I am? Praise be to God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, he says at the end of Romans 7. And in Romans 8, he begins to turn. He begins to look specifically to Jesus. In fact, did you realize that unlike Romans 7, where Paul mentions the Holy Spirit only once, in Romans 8, Paul mentions the Holy Spirit 19 separate times. Paul shifts his focus from our justification through faith in Christ to now a believer's everyday life in the unending love of God through Christ. He emphasizes two primary things, a faithfulness to God to be faithful to love us. Number two, an empowering work of God in us by the Holy Spirit, which compels us to love God above all things. Thus, as children of God, joint heirs with Christ. Paul in Romans chapter 8 details to us how you and I live in true freedom. From the penalty of our wretched sin, from the power of our sinful flesh, by the truth of the justification of God, the finished work of Christ, by reminding us that God is for us in Christ. You see, there were many Christ followers in the day that were struggling with this, and Paul wants to assure them of their secured position in Christ. In fact, we have an example of this. 86 years ago, there was a pilot by the name of Amelia Earhart. And she was made famous because she was the first female to sail across the Atlantic Ocean. And she was endeavoring to be the first female to ever fly across the world. But she tragically went missing. In fact, her disappearances are still one of the greatest unsolved mysteries of all time. But did you realize Amelia Earhart's final last words? Her one true last transmission ever heard by anybody else? Position doubtful. Paul doesn't want us to be doubtful about our position in Christ. Paul doesn't want God's people wondering where is God in his love? to these circumstances. And so, though unpleasant and trying circumstances can have a detrimental influence on our faith, no circumstance or event can cause a genuine Christ follower to be separated from the power and the permanence of a never stopping, never giving up of, lo of, of the love of God in Christ, which unites us and binds us eternally with him. God will never stop loving us. And so as Paul moves from an argument from the greater to the lesser, he gives here a litany in verses 35 through 39 of disasters and unspeakable, severe circumstances. He gives 17 of these in verses 35 through 39. And so for the sake of our time, I'm going to go over seven of these together, and then I'm going to summarize the last 10, all to remind us that God is for us in Christ. With that in mind, look at verses 35 through 37. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ, Paul says in Romans 8? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? For as it is written, for your sake, we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep led to the slaughter. No, I say in all of these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And let's stop right there. Paul begins Romans 8 in verse 1 by stating there is now no condemnation for those in Christ. He now tells us in verse 35, there is also no separation of those in Christ. You see, we can only love and be faithful to God because God is faithful and loves us in any circumstance and at any time. Paul then gives seven severe circumstances to remind us of these things. And I'll remind you in reading these. Six of these at the time of Romans 8, Paul had experienced six of them. He would ultimately experience martyrdom as well, the seventh. But here we go. God is faithful to love us even through tribulation in verse 35. It carries the idea here of severe adversity in general. It, it conveys an image of being squeezed or placed under immense Pressure. Throughout the Bible, the word is used of outward difficulties, but emotional stress can apply as well. You ever been in that circumstance? 
Have you ever felt squeezed out, weighed down? Paul, continuing at this point, he references the word distressed and speaks of a word of a strict confinement or being helplessly blocked into one location. Sometimes in our flesh, we can feel stuck. We can feel caught or in an undesirable, uncontrollable situation. We can feel isolated and alone. We must guard our hearts and minds. We must keep our resolve, not on how we see our circumstances, but no, keeping our focus on God through the circumstances. God is faithful to lovingly provide us the power to withstand anything that he calls us to. Until God provides a way of escape, he is faithful to be faithful to us. Any affliction suffered for the sake of Christ is never without Christ and is always worth it for Christ. Additionally, famine is often a result of persecution, as well as nakedness, which suggests the idea of having feeling vulnerable or isolated or unprotected. Consequently, then danger or peril is inevitable. Mistreatment from those opposed to Christ comes to those who follow Christ. We've got to guard our minds in such a time as this. You and I, as we head to 2024, are arguably headed to one of the most three most contentious elections in the history of our country. There are polarizing arguments on both sides. We've got to keep our eyes on Christ. And some of you heard over the weekend that more than likely COVID is on its way again in the Christmas season. All these proposed lockdowns and vaccines and all of these sorts of things. We've got to stand firm in the Lord Jesus Christ. We've got to stand firm in the sovereignty of God. We've got to be encouraging one another with the encouraging faithful of the love of God. Because ultimately, martyrdom by the sword can happen. This has been true since the beginning of the Lord's church, not only in the book of Acts, but now century to century of God's people. Christ's followers have to preserve, have to endure suffering, merciless hardship for following Christ. Because we know God promises to meet all of our needs according to the riches of Christ. In fact, uh, Paul reaffirms this point of martyrdom and suffering by quoting in verse 36, Psalm 44, verse 22. Psalm 44 is a psalm about the people of God and suffering. This is the way of life. This is what you and I have chosen as we are to be in the world, but not of the world. That receiving the life of Christ will cost you yours. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24? His disciples had been following him almost two years. And they came to him once again, and Jesus told them, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. This is the Jesus way of life. This is how you and I have prioritized our lives, to treasure Christ above all things. And in choosing Christ, it is from Him choosing us. And being faithful to Christ, it is from His faithfulness to us. In loving Christ, it is from an abiding, abounding love of God to us, which makes us then more than conquerors. Look at verse 37. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us, Paul said. What things, Paul? Some of these things? No, he says all of these things. Everything in the believer's experience in Christ, the joys, the sorrows, the setbacks, the triumphs, we are more than conquerors. You see this word here, conquerors? Paul uses a compound verb to make his point. It can be translated over conquerors, super duper conquerors. It conveys here more than a glorious victory. You see, conquerors in antiquity described a collective group of people who were supremely victorious in overcoming anything and everything that threatens or impedes them. God has us through anything in life because God is for us. Now, I'll remind you that Paul isn't speaking here of kind of this baseless triumphism 
He's not saying here, all I do is win, 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 no matter what. He's not saying that at all. What he is saying is that within the context of Romans 8, that God is faithful to be faithful to empower us through any trial or circumstance, not by our own strength or might, but by his through us. You see, the book of Romans was written to believers in Rome who were being inundated with polytheism, a belief in many, many, many gods, the Roman gods and the Greek gods. And at the time of Romans 8, the Greeks believed in the goddess Nike. You have this on your shoes and your gear and your swag with a company called Nike. And the Greek goddess of Nike was the goddess of victory and might. According to the gods, she had the ability to predict victory, but could not enable victory. In fact, she would often just give the victor a wreath. In stark contrast, God does not just declare us conquerors, but works through us to that end. It is God in us and God with us because God is for us that you and I can get through any circumstance in life. In Christ, we are more than conquerors, Paul says. Because God loves us, he saves us. And because he saves us, he lovingly embraces us and keeps us. Therefore, you and I are more than conquerors in any circumstance. That we will do more than, than simply endure, survive in this hostile world. Then we will provide and have encouragement to us through our own spiritual battles and our own sinfulness or lack of faithfulness, even in some ominous circumstance. We are more than conquerors through his steadfast love and faithfulness. Regardless of the situation, God will not fail. Regardless of any circumstance, nothing or no one can stop God's love to us. Remember how Paul started this argument in Romans 8, 31? Who shall then separate us from the love of God? Remember what Paul told the church of Philippi in Philippians 1, 6? And I am confident of these things, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ. It was John Knox, the great Scottish reformer, who literally led one of the greatest revivals in all of Scotland, who said of this verse, one man and God is the majority. That God never wastes a thing. That these trials, this testing, this turbulent time even in our own country, no, God will take the, the weaknesses of these things to display his strength. That he will, through his ability, through us, divinely refine us by the power of his love to be exactly who he's called us to be. Thus then, in any circumstance, we are more than conquerors because we will be supremely stronger through this. None of us will choose this on our own. We didn't sign up for this. God chose you for this. God saved you to this. You're more than conquerors through him who loved us. And as God has already given us our greatest treasure, the Lord Jesus who is the only begotten from the Father, is supremely greater than any treasure, even if that is what God teaches us. And what this world, this wherever we're going, takes from us, if all we learn is that Jesus was enough, that Jesus is the greatest treasure, it's worth it. Through him who loved us, you are more than conquerors. How could this happen? I mean, who would have devised this? Not us. Who would have thought of, of this? Not you and I. That the sheep are more than conquerors? How is this made possible? Not in something that we have done. Not in something that we could ever do. But know the work that God has done on our behalf. The sheep are conquerors because of God's lion, the Lord Jesus Christ. We praise God this week as high school football is about to start. And so, man, we are jacked up and excited to root for our teams in the Tulsa area and the hometowns that we came from all over Oklahoma. And wouldn't you know it that according to an article in Sports Illustrated, 
Oklahoma high schools have some of the best mascots in the entire country. So maybe you're rooting for this Friday, the old Alva gold bugs, the Miami war dogs. How about the Paoli pugs? Or the Dewey Bull Dodgers? How about from Southeast Oklahoma, the Atoka Wampus Cats? How about in Eastern Oklahoma, the Watts Engineers or the Mill Creek Bullfrogs? How about for where I'm from, just south of us in Grady County, the Chickasha Fighting Chicks? Not to be outdone by one of the smallest schools in Oklahoma, the eight man football wonders, the Bray Doyle Fighting Donkeys which by the way are, according to this article in Sports Illustrated, the only fighting donkeys in the entire country. And those of us from Oklahoma were like, yeah, of course they are, right? <laughs> These guys have worked all summer. These guys have put in the work. They have came as collective individuals to be a part of something greater than themselves as a team. They're gonna play their hearts out. Very few of them are gonna go undefeated. Only a handful of them are ever going to be state champions. But you can be assured, because of the love of God and the work of the Son of God, that through his love, all of us, as these wee little sheep, can be more than conquerors through him who loved us. Did you notice at the end of verse 37 that Paul renders this word love in the past tense? It's specifically here, as a grammarian, an aorist tense. It's communicating here a past action of God on our behalf. It refers to the gift of the Lord Jesus Christ, his work for us and in us. You see, this word love here is of this word agapo. It's a very rare word in antiquity. Most Greek historical writers never use this word one time. But yet the New Testament uses agapo 250 separate times. The Lord Jesus has changed everything. It is God's selfless, self-denying, unconditional, sacrificial love through Christ that can transform your life. And it's this love that God lovingly gives to us. The magnitude of God's love for us is Christ. God is not against us. God is for us in Christ. Paul concludes triumphantly this chapter by giving here a a beautiful summary of of what he's already previously said. You you think, well, wait a minute. Why why would he say this again? Because as the great theologian he is and the masterful speaker that he is, he's reinforcing his previous point. He gives here in a continuation of his thoughts a a means in which he is completely assured of these things of what he's already affirmed. For Paul, he's fully convinced. Nothing can separate him from the love of God, his eternal relationship with Christ. Absolutely nothing. And so that is why in one sentence in the original languages, 10 separate designations, Paul says in verses 38 and 39, for I am sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Paul is resolved. He is set in these things. Nothing, no one, never can separate us from the love of God in Christ. I've had the privilege the last couple of weeks of, of taking my oldest son, Major, to football practice. And he, Major goes to Metro, and that's about 30 minutes from where we live, and so he has practice at 6.30, which means we've got to leave the house by 6 a.m. Not always the easiest thing in our household. And so in God's sense of humor, every single day this week, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, when I come home at about 7, 7.05 a.m., one of our neighbors is walking her bulldog. And so the, the, the first day, you know, the bulldog's kind of plopping around a little bit, and I'm kind of waiting for this bulldog to go across my driveway, and I kind of wave at her. And, but then Tuesday and Wednesday, we kind of begin to strike up this relationship. So I said, hey, what's your bulldog's name? And she said, Rocky. What a great name for a bulldog. But I could tell by about Wednesday or Thursday of this week that my neighbor was way more excited about this walk every day than old Rocky was. 
In fact, by Thursday, that leash was as tight as it could get. In fact, Friday morning, all of us are like this sometimes, right? She was literally dragging Rocky across my driveway, and she just kind of waved, and I waved at her, and I said, you know, Rocky, you're right. In regard to Romans 8, 38 and 39, we need to be a lot more like Rocky. In other words, Christ followers are not just to be dogmatic about God's love in Christ. We're to be bulldogmatic. We're to be set. We're to be unmoved. We're to have a resolve that regardless of what happens on the outside, I know God loves me with a steadfast, one-directional, never stopping, never giving up love on the inside. So in closing, what does this mean for us? Not certain crisis or death, nor ever tragedy, ever changing tragedies of life will separate us from the love of God in verse 38. Not an invasion of a multitude of angels or a myriad of rebellious demons, nor the problems and responsibilities of today or the worries of tomorrow. Nothing today, nothing tomorrow, nothing forever can keep us from the love of God. And nothing in time or eternity, no difficulty or danger or loss or traumatic experience, no trial or tribulation, not even the luminous majesty of heaven or the emptiness, dark pit of hell. Not anything man-made, mandated, circumvented, orchestrated, or tolerated can literally separate you from the love that God has for you in Christ. Now, did you notice that Paul didn't say everybody at the end of verse 39? But us, he says, who will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord? Who is us? Who is he talking about? Specifically, those who have, by God's grace, repented of their sin and received God's love through faith in God's Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. That is why in Romans 8, 29, the us is those whom he foreknew. Those whom he justified, already good is glorified in verse 30. The us are who God is for in verse 31. Who Christ died for in verse 32. Who Christ is presently interceding for in verse 34. The us are whom God's love will never be separated from. Verses 35 through 39. Is this us? Are you part of the us? It is true, biblically, that God has a general love for all people. Jesus says in John 3, for God so loved the world that God graciously bestows his common grace upon all people. The just and the unjust receive rain. The just and the unjust receive the necessities and resources of life. But there is a redeeming love. There is a saving love that only God gives to those who have placed their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Those who have a general love who are not of the us are still in their sins, will be judged in their sins and receive God's wrath and condemnation. The us in Romans 8 verse 39 are those who have repented of their sin, confessed it before a holy God, have lovingly given it to him for all that they are in light of who he is, and have received his steadfast, forgiving love, his mercy through the Lord Jesus Christ. It is this love that you and I rest in. It is this love that we must guard our hearts in. It is this love that we take to the world For we are Romans 8 people in a Romans 3 world. And it's not always the easiest thing. Some of the greatest theologians of all time have struggled with this daily. Many of you have heard me quote before Martin Luther, arguably one of the top five to six theologians the Lord has ever allowed us to read from, to learn from. And so many of you know that Luther was instrumental, used by God to start a reformation that that literally changed the world, a a result of of you and I even worshiping here, arguably, could be a result of of the faith of our previous brothers and sisters during this time. But what you don't know is that Martin Luther struggled daily with depression. 
melancholy. For whatever reason, he would have these seasons where he would just be struck with struggling towards light within his own darkness. In one specific time, God in his goodness gave him a wife who loved Jesus more than him. Men, you need to remind the Lord of his goodness and grace to you. That you've been given a wife that loves Jesus more than you. It's one of the greatest gifts God's ever given me, you. So this wife, Kate, she saw what her husband was struggling with. And he come home from church one day and he finds Kate in a black dress, in a black veil. He answers the door and says, what is wrong with you, oh dear woman? And she said, didn't you hear the news? God is dead. Luther struck by her bluntness, tells her in this house that is blasphemy. And his wife looked at him and said, really? What is the difference between me telling you God is dead and you living like God is dead? Because for the last several weeks, you're living like our king is not alive. You're living like his love has stopped flowing to you. Which is worse, me saying it or you living it? God got a hold of such truth from a godly woman. And Luther ran to his office and he wrote in Latin on his desk. Are you ready for this? Vivit, which means he lives. And this was a daily reminder of Luther for the rest of his life. God is alive. God is not against us. God is for us in Christ. It is one thing to say we believe it. It is a whole nother thing to live it. Are we living this truth? For the foundation for our love for one another is God's love for us. May this empower our attitudes each and every day of God and toward God. The God in heaven is not keeping a score of our rights or wrongs, of our successes and failures, because our perfect standing is seen not in light of you and I's performance, but Christ's performance on our behalf. May it guide then our attitudes towards others who have not received this unconditional love of God yet, but yet can see it through you and in you. Are we igniting conversations of hope? Are we igniting conversations of this resolved steadfastness in the love of God? Or are we providing more questions than answers to those who see us? This also then empowers our actions. Then all of life is for God. That there is nothing I'm doing to earn more of God's love. There's nothing I've done that could receive less of God's love. No, because he loves me, I'm gonna give my best. Because he loves me, I'm gonna obey. Because he loves me, I'm gonna love all of those that he puts in my daily path because I am to love them as God has loved me with a never stopping, never giving up, always abounding love that comes not from the world, that comes not from philosophy, but that comes from God himself through the Lord Jesus Christ. We are Romans eight people in a Romans three world. May we be resolved to keep our minds and our hearts and our feet always moving toward this love and from this love that will never fail. You are loved. God is for us in Christ. May we live for him as we love this world that he's placed us in for his glory.